you imagine generating electricity from potato that we eat? Today, we shall showcase a guy that generates electricity from that same potato. Also, we will explain what is meant by international workstation and what it does. Watch out for this and more on the show today. Hi, I'm Tim Tayo Fagborong and this is Engineering Track. The International Space Station is the largest man-made structure in space. It was built in pieces and then launched into space and assembled in orbit. In this video, I want to give you a detailed look at the station. We're going to look at each module in the order that they were assembled. We'll look at the countries involved and the future plans for the station. So if you're ready, let's go build a space station. The International Space Station, or ISS, took many years to become a reality. In 1984, the United States announced a project called Space Station Freedom. Here's some drawings of what the original station might have looked like. It was never actually built in its original form. There were lots of redesigns and its funding was almost completely cut by US Congress. Then in 1993, after several other countries were brought on board, the name was officially changed to the International Space Station. Five years later, construction begins in space. I'll show you the complete construction process. But first, let's learn a little bit more about the station. This is the ISS as it looks today. It's mainly used to conduct science experiments that can only be done in space. There's usually six astronauts on board the station. They generally switch out about every six months so that no one spends too much time in space. The station is about the size of an American football field. It's located just outside the Earth's atmosphere. This is called low Earth orbit. It's not very high up considering that some satellites orbit way out here. The ISS only takes about 92 minutes to orbit the Earth. That's about 28,000 kilometers per hour. Over time, the ISS will slowly lose altitude. If nothing was done, the station would eventually burn up as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. To prevent this, the station must be periodically reboosted to stay in space. The main countries now participating are United States, Canada, Russia, Japan, and many countries from the European Space Agency. Let's get to know the main parts of the station. The integrated truss structure is kind of like the backbone of the station. It holds the solar arrays to generate electricity, radiator panels, these remove heat from the station, and other equipment and science experiments are also attached. This part down here contains the pressurized modules, which means the astronauts can live and work in here without a spacesuit. All of the Russian modules make up the Russian orbital segment. The other side is called the United States Orbital Segment. It's made up of modules from the United States, Europe, Japan, and Canada. The different pieces of the station, also called modules, were built in many locations around the globe. Each module was then launched into space by one of these three rockets. The American Space Shuttle, the Russian Proton Rocket, and the Russian Soyuz Rocket. Once in space, it's time to put it all together. This is definitely not your average LEGO set. Once construction started, the ISS took a little over a decade before it was considered complete. Each one of these lines represents the addition of a new module to the station. Let's go ahead and start at the very beginning. 
The first piece of the station is a Russian module called Zarya. It provides power from the solar arrays and also propulsion when there's a need to move the station. There's three docking ports in front and one in back. These will be used to connect to the next pieces of the station. The second module is American and it's called Unity or Node 1. It has six docking ports to connect to future modules. There's a special piece here to connect between the different docking mechanisms. This is called a Pressurized Mating Adapter, or PMA for short. Unity was launched with PMA1 and PMA2. This is the Zvezda service module. It provides life support systems and is considered the functional center of the Russian orbital segment. It also has three docking ports in front and one in back. Next is the Z1 truss. This holds equipment for the station. It's not part of the main truss, but it provided a temporary mounting place as we'll see here in a moment. PMA3 was then added to the bottom side of Unity. It's always good to have an extra one of these around. The P6 truss was temporarily mounted to the top of the Z1 truss. This includes the first solar array wings. This provides much needed power to the growing station. Radiator panels were also installed to help remove excess heat from the station. At this point, there was enough functionality that astronauts can start living aboard the station, instead of just temporary visits. From November 2000 until now, there has been a continuous human presence on board the station. The Destiny module is also called the US Laboratory. This is a place where a lot of scientific research happens. A little rearranging was necessary so that Destiny could be installed. March 2001 came the addition of the External Stowage Platform 1, or ESP-1. This was a place to store spare parts for the station. Canada made a vital contribution with the Canadarm2. It's a robotic arm that can help around the outside of the station. It's usually controlled by an astronaut who's on the inside of the station. Either end of the arm can be attached to one of these grapple fixtures that you'll find on various modules. The Quest airlock allows the astronauts to safely step outside for a few hours to perform an EVA, also known as a spacewalk. This is a Russian module called Piers. It can be used as an airlock for spacewalks or as a docking port to allow visiting spacecraft to attach to the station. Now we get to start building the integrated truss structure. If you remember from earlier, this is kind of like the backbone of the station. Our first piece is the S0 truss and it gets attached to the top of the Destiny module. The Mobile Remote Servicer Base System, or MBS, was added next. This platform can move along the truss. It's especially useful when the Canadarm2 is attached. Then the S1 truss was added, followed by the P1 truss. The S stands for starboard, and the P stands for port. This way you know on which side of the station it's on. Each side has room for three more radiator panels. For now, only the center ones will be installed. ESP2 was added to the station right next to the Quest airlock. This is the P3, P4 truss segments with solar arrays and another radiator panel. The tiny P5 truss goes at the end here. To balance out the station, we'll have to retract a few panels. The following year, the other sides of the truss were added as well. ESP3 goes down here, and then the P6 truss can be moved to its final resting place. It's also time to deploy a few more radiator panels. The Harmony module is also called Node 2. It will be attached to the forward end of Destiny, but first we have to do some more rearranging. Harmony has six docking ports which will allow for further expansion of the station. Next comes the Columbus module, which is a European laboratory. Now we get some more robotics also built by Canada. This is a space robot called Dexter. It can attach to the same grapple fixtures that are used by the Canadarm2. In fact, Dexter is most useful when it's attached to the end of the Canadarm2. The largest module is the Japanese experiment module, also known as Kibo. It came up to the station in several pieces. It even has its own robotic arm. Finally, we have the S6 truss, the last of the truss segments. Now we're starting to look a little more like the space station. These solar arrays will be rotated so that they face towards the sun. This helps the arrays generate more power for the station. The Japanese experiment module has one last addition. It's called the Japanese Exposed Facility. This allows research to be conducted in the vacuum of space. The Russian module Poisk is very similar to Piers. It was another place for Russian spacecraft to dock. This is the first Express Logistic Carrier, or ELC-1. This is a place to store hardware to help the station work correctly. ELC-2 was installed on top of the truss here. The Tranquility module, also known as Node 3, is added to the side of Unity. On the bottom side of Tranquility is a small room called the Cupola. This has seven windows from which to see the view. Each window has a cover that can be closed when they are not in use. Then came another Russian module called Rasvet. 
This was used for storage and as another docking port. The Leonardo module is used for storage of supplies and waste. The trash will build up here until it can be removed from the station. Here's ELC 3 and 4. This is a science experiment called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. It's used to study rare particles such as antimatter. A more recent addition to the station is called the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, or BEAM for short. It takes up a small amount of space during launch and then inflated once attached to the station. BEAM is an experiment to see if this kind of technology can work. The ISS only has funding through 2025, but hopefully that will be extended. After that, we may see pieces of the station repurposed for other projects in space. I have a... I'm a science student in secondary school. So after secondary school, I went to Polytechnic, but due to financial uh, short term, so I couldn't be able to finish there. But I have a science uh, background. Uh, what, what motivated me to start my research on electricity is due to the lack of power supply. Because like in my area, we don't used to have light at all. So most of the time, like let's say for good eight months, so we don't have light. So that's why I started my research. Because I know everything in this world has a solution. So that's where I started my research then. This is, we can use two type of uh, potato for this uh, experiment. This one is sweet potato. This is sweet potato, so we can also use uh, Irish potato for this experiment. So, but it's not as big as the potato is, so but the amount of energy that we can generate from each. This one now, we have to boil it for some specific minutes, so to be able to get more energy. So this one is raw now. It doesn't mean that this one don't have energy. It has energy, but the boil one. So we have more power than this one. So after the boiling, so you have to cut it. It has a way of, you need copper. It has a way of arranging the wire inside. So why most of people don't get it? A lot of people have been trying it to do it. They send it to me on WhatsApp in my email. So I just laugh, but it has a way of arranging the wire inside this potato to be able to get enough energy. So, but we just demonstrate little so to you so that you can see. So the very first thing is, this is copper electric, and this one is zinc. So now, how do we know the positive and negative inside this potato? Now, so I will show you now. So I want to show you how I know the positive and the negative. So now, which one is positive, which one is negative? So, let me show you. So, I want to know the positive and the negative. See what we have here. If it is wrong, this metal will be in negative. So, you 
you see it's reading minus so but if my connection is right actually i know the positive and i know the negative but for you to just understand that's why so so you see, you see now it's reading so now let me put it in the wrong way so that you will see the positive and the so it's reading negative so but if i really want to do it i will cut it into three so this copper will be inside not outside like this so like this one now see the one that is open okay so this one is wrong so So if your connection is right, the meter will show you that this thing is right. And if it is wrong, you will know from the meter. So this one is reading negative. Because this is negative, this is positive. So, so that's where I started the research the first thing is to identify the positive and the negative so that is the very first thing so when you are able to identify the positive so you can stay so another thing is how to arrange the wire so that's what really give me a lot of problem so and i asked from somebody that read the electrical electronics so it told me about series connection and parallel connection so when you understand that you'll be able to know how to arrange the wire because if the connection is not right you can never get the light at all so those are the stage so that's where I, before it was not like this so i tried to upgrade it so that it will be more portable to carry so that's the current stage now. So, uh, this is it. Ideally, if the, the build, a building in itself is not an event. It's a process starting from the design through to uh, planning, which is regulatory. You also have the tender processes before construction. And during construction, supervision goes with it. And of course, the people that use the firm. Now, I say for myself that the issue of collapse, there are three key things. Corruption, greed, ignorance, and of course the lack of political will to see through legislation. In all the processes, the steps, the stages that I've recounted, you have all these elements present in them for design, you need the structural engineer. You must be a qualified structural engineer. And for, 
for, for processes like this, registering and being a member of the Nigerian Institution of Structural Engineers is really mandatory because then you have people you can hold, organized uh, processes. But when we do building construction or design, our uh, people are either ignorant or greedy. They now, call, they now patronize those they shouldn't be patronizing. Of course, when designs are also being done, there are classifications. You design a new structure or you refurbish. Or someone, a, a building that is existing, you want to use it for other purposes. You revert to the structural engineer. Can I use this building, which was designed for residential? Can I use it for this other purpose? This is where uh, it's important to actually ensure that what needs to be done is done. And that is where regulation comes in. The governments, yes, they will come perhaps to fulfill all righteousness, but they do come. And that's one of the reasons why most of the structures that have been collapsing have not been, a few of them have uh, government-related uh, things because they, they consult, they consult. But when it comes to the private sector and they, uh, let me, I'm sorry to say even, some of our churches and religious organizations, she can bear us out. At our church, whenever we do designs, they are done by qualified people, and we insist that the necessary approvals must be taken. In one of the last development, we said if the approvals are not taken, then count us out. And this is where enforcement also needs to be going on. Regulation, we, I know of engineering firms that backed out of supervision of a project simply because the client and the contractors were not building to specification. And when these issues are reported to the, uh, organi org I mean, uh, uh, the bodies, the planning and the approval authorities, it is expected that they should act. Well, if they now refuse to act, then something is wrong somewhere. The excellence is a stop work order. It says that whatever is going on here is questionable. Please produce your working permit, your approved building plan. What threats do you have to carry out this instruction, this construction? That is a stop working order. That's the red mark. That is what it implies. It does not necessarily imply that it is uh, ready for demolition. And sometimes after, after the person has complied with the necessary plan and approval, then the building can continue. But I will not say that this happens in all cases. I'm just giving a general over overview of the situation with the red mark. That's a general overview. Okay. It's so a stop work order. I hope you enjoyed the program. For inquiries and sponsorship, call the numbers on your screen. Join us for another interesting edition next time.